if we take a look at IoT, IoT have been coined by what this this is Kevin Ashton. He's he's the father of IoT, and uh, he have coined this since 1999. It was very long time ago when he was working in uh, Procter and Gamble. He was a manager there, trying to understand how he can. Uh, understand the, the conditions of the assets, especially in the lipstick, you know, the color of lipstick, how many lipstick is still in the shops, how many lipsticks in the warehouse and all that. So when he worked in IMIT, he decided to use a technology called RFID. So the RFID is able to do the tagging. So he can tag the assets, the, lip, the, the boxes of the lipstick. So he can trace uh, how many uh, lipstick are still in on the shelf, what kind of colors and where they are and how many are they in the, the warehouse. So RFID is one of the earliest technologies being used in uh, IoT. So even during that time, that's the time when internet have been introduced to the world. So the commercial have just been introduced in the early 1990s, uh, early 90s about the, the internet of things. So the idea to send the data over the internet and that's when the IoT comes to place. Yeah, But the most important part is that he understands how IoT can affect the business. And uh, we, as a business users, you know, when you go out as, a, as your carrier, as a professional carrier, you will get to know that your organizations also need to transform every three to seven years. Transform means the, the way that they do things, technologies that they utilize, the technology that they embrace. If you're still within the old technologies and unwilling to make any changes, you're going to become obsolete. 19% yeah, of the companies that existence today, you know, the last 50 years is only 19%. So meaning to say that a lot of products have been obsolete, a lot of services have been discontinued, and a lot of companies uh, already not in existence today. So it's important for us as a new, new generation who comes out as a new carrier, learning new things, can embrace new technologies because other companies are embracing that. So if you don't, you're not, you are still at the old age, you become like a dinosaur. So once upon a time, you know, uh, in, in my bags, there's a lot of gadgets. <laughs> so uh, I, I bring a lot of cables. You got to understand cables are very important at that time. Even the devices have different kind of uh, cable devices, interfaces, uh, different gadgets have different functions. Uh, a phone is just a phone. Uh, a PDA is a PDA, yeah, it's a camera, it's a camera. So you need different cables to connect. So I bring a, one back to, to carry all of these gadgets. But because of the convergence of technology, what's interesting to see that all the things that you're doing now, the, the things that you are listening, the things that you take photo, photos, the thing that you view, the videos, your, your calendar, your, your, your emails, your calculator, your alarm clock is now only in a single device, which is your smartphone. And that has taken over a lot of products. And you, you will never see these in, uh, products, you know, uh, very rare. You can see that individually. You cannot find this, this thing in the market a lot of times. A lot, a, lot, uh, a lot of times you will not see these products anymore. So this is what the convergence of technology that really affects us. And it is important what you have seen, Mr. Tan, I've already uh, uh, showed to you the past and the present and the future. So it's very important for us to learn about the past. And many of us who are in this era, like myself, have gone under, undergone the different changes in terms of technology. So we are fortunate in the case that to see uh, the world have changed from analog to digital. And, but some of you are born digital. You are what we call the digital native. The day that you're born, you are born together with an iPad with a smartphone so it's different from the day that we have uh, in the early days you know even when you want to uh, get information you have to go to the library really go to the library and read the books yeah so that's the difference about what we are doing today even if you see that technology comes in cycle it's important to understand the cycle of the technology in terms of once it's been introduced to the market and in moment it become uh, matured and then it died off and the new technology comes to replace them the first generation mobile is analog, purely analog. For the last 10 years, analog has been existence in the market, the first generation. So it peaks at the fifth year and it dies down in the 10th year. So whenever it peaks at the matured, 
the new technology is going to be introduced. So the second generation using digital, GSM, SMS, MMS, you know, WAP, WAP as a way for us to browse the internet is being introduced, GPRS, very low speed data. So that's when, when it matches, the third generation comes in, when third generation matches, the fourth generation comes in. So when the fourth generation matches, you are seeing the fifth generation is being introduced. So now we have heard a lot of other countries are now implementing five, fifth generation mobile. So that means that a lot of countries have already matched the fourth. <laughs> I have someone to. Okay, <laughs> right. So that, that's an interruption. In the the webinar. Okay. So what I'm saying is that whenever there is a peak, uh, peak in the maturity of the technology, a new generation comes in. This is what happened of cycles of technology, and we could understand uh, all this technology will be, be, be replaced by new ones. Yeah. So now. Uh, when fifth generation mobile is being introduced in the market, the sixth generation mobile is now under research. Before they really, uh, for the, the next five years, they will define what is sixth generation mobile, what are the standards, what are the new modulation if they are being required, what are the new specs, and what are the changes they're going to make. Once fifth generation is peak at the fifth year, you will see the sixth generation will be introduced to the market because standards have been stabilized. That's how technology cycles comes in. As you know, it's a big wave. Uh, I call this ripples of technology. So technology come in many uh, kind of uh, places. Yeah? So in IoT, it's the same thing. So IoT plays a big role in, in the new era of IR 4.0 is because it's the one of the most uh, uh, core or fundamental building blocks. Without IoT, you will never get the right data for you to do whatever that you talk about, having uh, big data analytics, artificial intelligence using machine learning, you need data. So the way for you to get data, one way of getting data is through the census data and the things that you, you're going to connect it. So other than just the normal IT data, you also need to bring in sources from the sensor data. So IoT, basically, if you want, want to learn IoT, there are main, four main components. The first one is the sensors, the electrical part, the hardware part. You need to know what sensors are. It's from analog sensors that you need to make it turn. Now is you have to turn into digital. So that's how you want to turn it. The human sensors, which is five sensors that we have, turns into digital sensors for temperature, humidity, pressure, proximity, accelerometer, location. All of these are digital sensors, and it's important for you to learn of how to digitize, yeah? to turn it into a digital uh, sensors, a digital information data. So once the data is being gathered, you must find a way for you to send the data out. What kind of connectivity? So that's the second component that you must learn. There are a lot of connectivity options. The fixed network using the cable or fiber optics, that's one way. But because IoT is a very small device, it requires you to send data from wireless because it can be placed, placed anywhere. So it is consume uh, less consumption of bat uh, power. So it can be a, a battery based. You can place any sensors everywhere. So you can bring it from your wearable device. You can attach it everywhere. So wireless is one of the, the, the easiest way to connect IoT sensors. But then, Again, wireless have many options. Yeah, so it depends on the kind of applications. It can be as very near to you, what we call the body area network. You might have like NFC, you know, RFID sort of. Uh, and then you might have ZP, return protocol. You might have like local area network using Bluetooth, Wi-Fi. And then you can go even 3G, 4G, 5G network for a wide area network. Or you can even go to satellite. But then because of IoT nature of very small device, uh, low power, uh, need to have better range, uh, smaller amounts of data being sent, you know? So you might have IoT networks, IoT technology. So you got to learn technology that you might now heard about NB IoT, yeah, narrow band IoT, which is licensed band. 
and then you need to know about uh, LTE and you need to know about LoRa and Sigfox. I will show it to you later. Yeah. So these are the new IoT technologies that you need to learn to get to understand. And then from there, where do you send the data? So you must send the data and pack it and host it somewhere. So it's in the cloud. Even though it's in the cloud, it must have a middleware, a software that that manage your your devices, manage your information, manage the information that you get from the sensors, and 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 open an API for you, for other people to use your data. So this is what we call the IoT middleware. So you need to learn about protocol like REST protocol, MQTT protocol, CoAP protocol. So they have different different protocol techniques depending on the device itself. So some device is is. It's always con constantly have power, you might use REST. So if some device is less consume, consume power, you might use MQTT, for example. So these are the, the technology that you need to learn. Yeah? But on the fourth level, on the fourth component, is where the application is being used. Application can be many things. One, either you can create a new workflow, a new applications altogether, your, your, your smart, smart building, smart water monitoring, smart, uh, parking. So these are applications that you build or new, new workflow, or you can have some analysis, big data analytics, enough data that can call you big data analytics. You can do some insights. You can create, you can do some machine learning, deep learning inside there, extract the data out, you can do your number crunching, and then you can do some prediction if you want to. Okay? And from there, you can even create a new product. Once we have that, this is a new product that you can go to the market. So, uh, as I mentioned to you, uh, this is something in the, the lower layers that you need to learn about technologies. So, you have to understand there are networks which is run on license band, which is meant for the operator. In, in Malaysia, for example, this telco is uh, Maxis, Telecom, Malaysia, Cellcom, uh, DG. These are the, the telco who operates in a license spec using license spectrum. So, LTEM and NBIoT. The difference between them is that LTEM is evolved from the LTE, the 4G that you have now using LTE, but for mobile version. Yeah. NB-IoT is being designed from ground up, so totally new. Yeah. So they have different parameters, as you can see there, uh, different parameters in terms of modulation technique, transmission bandwidth, uh, coupling loss, sensitivity, they have different. So, And then you have LoRa. LoRa is uh, anyone. So it's unlicensed band, LoRa and Sigfox. You can run on an unlicensed band. You can set up in your own campus, your own building, your own LoRa network. Yeah. So uh, it runs on 2.4 gigahertz on Wi-Fi spectrum and same spectrum. So Sigfox is another one, but it is more by uh, Sigfox Alliance. So they have their own backend system. It's more like telco based. But in Malaysia, uh, it's been run by uh, uh, an operator called Experanti. So they run Sigfox. So they have fully coverage on Sigfox. So LoRa can be more private. Sigfox is more public. Yeah. So depends on how you want to use it. You take a look at the kind of uh, data that's been going to be transmitted. Is it small amount, zero uh, about uh, 200 kilobit, or you want to have 100 bit per second, or you want to have 1 megabit per second? So you might choose different technologies. So once you understand this, then you can uh, use this technology to, to connect your sensors. And as I mentioned to you just now, the most important part of IoT is to collect the data. So to acquire data and send it out and get up to the applications layer, because data is everything. So you need to learn data communications. And to learn data communications, you need to learn the OSI, the Open System Interconnection, seven layers. From day one, you have to be introduced in this area. I think all of you have done that, and I hope you got you 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 understand because I used to learn OSI seven layers in the universities, and you know I got blank. I don't know how to it relates to the whole data communication. But once you are you you are already working, then you understand that how important to differentiate different layers. From there, you know how these layers are going to interface to another layer. Otherwise, you are using different protocols. That's why protocol is the term in OSI seven layers. The physical layer, you know that you use either fixed or mobile. The modulation technique that you want to use, you know, QPS, K, you know, uh, whatever technique, the, the modulation technique on the physical layer, the file layer. 
On the second layer, you know all the protocols that you've used. You know, the, the A02.15.4, Zigbee, A02.16 for YMAX, A02.11 for Wi-Fi. All these new protocols you've got to learn on the second layer. And then the third layer, you talk about IP. It's what you have learned about IP addressing. Then the fourth layer is all about the, the uh, transport layer. Either you want to use TCP or UDP, you know, uh, with, uh, you can control area, then you, can, you want to control error, then you have TCP. You want to make it fast, you can use UDP. So you've got to understand why and when you use this, this protocol. And then the session layer, how you start your session for conversation from one node to one application to any application. Presentation layer, you want to do some security layer, secure it, some encryption technique, you want to compress your data, you might use presentation layer. Applications layer is the one that you use for transfer of your data, FTP, email, and so on and so forth. This is a, the seven layers that need to be introduced to you guys. So you have to refer back. Even the four layers of IoT is being mapped into the seven layers of Python. Yeah, the same thing. And then we talk about this term called industrial revolution. There's a, there's a, actually, there's a meaning when we talk about revolution. We don't want the technology that we want to embrace in a very slow and gradual manner. The word revolution is very disruptive. It's very sudden. It's a totally total change. That's what we call revolution. And it's very fast. But it is very slow, gradual. Then you call it evolution. We are not calling our evolution, IR industrial evolution 4.0. So we don't evolve slowly. So it is a very drastic change not only to the, the, the way that we do things, but to the business. And the business model have changed very rapidly. So it's very destructive. That's why uh, this topic is all about. Yeah? When we talk about uh, destructive, this is IR 4.0. And then let us take a look. I think most of you have heard about Industry 4.0. The term Industry 4.0 have been coined uh, by the German, uh, the German, because mainly in the factory, in the manufacturing sector. So they started off because they are very strong in manufacturing. So they talk about when you are in industry, in the manufacturing sector, you are using mechaniz mechanization, steam engine power, all this using uh, uh, manual, they are industry 1.0. The 2.0, when they introduce electrical, so machines are being used, they can do a lot of mass production. Machines are helping them. So in 1969, when this and above, you see that internet has been introduced, computers, electronics have been introduced, machines are now being powered up by electron, electronics. But industry 4.0, this is where the cyber physical thing, internet is being connected to the machines. So internet of things. So you use other technologies to, to, to acquire data from the machines. Yeah? So that is the German way of talking industry 4.0. So the Malaysia, when we launch industry forward, the, you, you heard about this industry forward. It is mainly for the manufacturing sector. Yeah? And then the, the Japanese, the Japanese coined differently. They talk about society 5.0. Why not 4.0? So the, the society 5.0 is different. So their perception of looking at, at the way that they are, the way that they live, their society, what technologies are being used in their society. So in society 1.0, they are the hunting society. We, we find food by hunting. We are no longer there. So that is the, the old caveman way. But agricultural society is society 2.0, yeah? pertanian. So a lot of times, uh, countries which is based on their society to find food, economy, on agriculture, they are society 2.0. Society 3.0, they are using industrial. So they have moved to industrial. Machines are helping them. Industrial 4.0 is where Japan are looking more on information society. Everywhere you can get information. You can search information, find information through the internet. It's being fully utilized. Super smart society is very intelligent. So instead of you in the 4.0 is trying to seek information, in 5.0, it is so smart that it learns you about your profile. It understands about what you need. So instead of you searching for information, the information goes to you. So instead of you, you know, it's just a thing like you go to eBay after you purchase certain things and then it will show to you 
hey, you would like to buy another things. So it shows a lot of other, 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 other goods to attract you to buy because he under that that machines, that that system learns the way that you do things. So the early in the morning when I open up my uh, Google ways, he can immediately tell me the best routes. So it learns, you know, every day that how I travel, how fast, where I travel. So you make the recommendation. Yeah, Google also the same thing. So that is what we call the super smart society or society 5.0. That's the Japanese way. So they look at society. So uh, that is IR. Right? So industrial revolution 4.0 is slightly different it's because it is a bigger scope. It's not limited to manufacturing. It encompasses the whole other industries. So it's the same thing. I think uh, I just highlight to you like 1.0. If your industry is using manual and physical tool, that's 1.0. 2.0, you use electrical to help you. 3.0, you use internet, computers to help you. 4.0, it is intelligence. You use technologies like augmented reality, virtual reality, robotics, IoT, big data analytics, blockchain, drones. So these are the new technologies in the era of IR 4.0. Are we using that? Uh, that's the question. And, and if you take a look at the World Economic Forum, coined the term, uh, this is around 2014. Okay? And it's quite some time. But they, are, they already uh, identified several pillars of technology. They call it 12 technologies. They might define space technology as one of them. You know, they made geoengineering, a neurotechnology, which we haven't heard of, biotech, energy capture. But this is technologies being defined in fourth industrial revolution. I, I love the way that uh, Elon Musk is doing. So he, he actually building a lot of these things. So you see that how Tesla helps in terms of energy capture. So the, the, the uh, uh, electrical powered automobile, and then he used space technology, the, the Tesla, uh, the SpaceX. Yeah. So, so he have different technologies that he used for the in the fourth industrial revolution. And then in Malaysia, we also have defined in manufacturing sector, these are the technologies for industry forward. And this industry forward comprise of like AR, ABR, uh, big data analytics, IoT, robotics. But this is meant for the, the, the manufacturing sector. But you might be in different sector if you want to work later. So, uh, in construction, for example, they might not use the same as what the manufacturing sector. So they have their own roadmap. They build their own roadmap and the, the key technologies that require in the construction industry. For example, they have 12 technologies that they define. Uh, Pre-fabrication, modular construction, building information system, 3D scanning, uh, photogrammetry. So they have blockchain too, but they have also 3D printing. Yeah. So you, 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 you've got to understand like 3D printing in the construction sector becoming very key in producing houses. You can imagine when China last year, they built hospital during the COVID-19. How can they build hospitals in one area in very, very, very fast, very rapidly. So they use 3D printing. And they can even build a house in 24 hours. I've seen a video now in, in, in Saudi, they also can build 3D printing house in one day. So how many days that we can be our own house <laughs> nowadays? Two years you have to wait. No, I think technologies like this can help us. So it's very, very destructive. Yeah. So we got to understand if you're in education sector, you might be defined as differently. You're, you might say that robots is the most important in education sector. Why? Because it might replace the, 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 the lecturers or the teachers. Okay, or you might say that virtual reality is very important in, 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 ed, in education. So that's the key area, but the rest might not be important. So now the question is, so I go back to you, maybe this, Yanita the price, lah, but I would like to understand more, uh, maybe in the chat session, uh, if you can uh, give a chat somewhere there, give an answer. Where exactly is Malaysia or your country. I heard that Indonesia uh, uh, students are also here. Uh, what do you expect? Is it Malaysia, your, your country, is it in the era of 1.0, 2.0, 3 or 4? So you, you can put that in the chat session. Uh, I would like to see. 
But uh, again, uh, before, uh, let, let me explain to you again of how the scenario is going to be like. Eh? So it depends on how you work on this. So the way that you cook, in which era that you think that you do the way that you cook? Are you you're cooking in the cooking 4.0 or cooking 1.0? So if you use the, the method of, you know, using uh, charcoal, you know, real fire and all that, it might be 1.0, right? But if you are uh, using uh, an oven which is electrically powered, power just power on, the, you can turn on the number, uh, the how many minutes? That's it. It's two point zero the temperature. Very simple setting. In three point zero, you might have an electronic version that you can compute it. Uh, no, you can program it. A cake is different. You barbecue is also different. You cook something is also different things. So you might program it. So it's 3.0 way of cooking. In 4.0 way of cooking is that you use a 3D printing to cook. Are you using that? You can cook a burger. So that's how people in, you, you, you can imagine, you cannot cook the way that one, two or three when you are in the space station, right? In the space station, there's only, <laughs> you cannot use fire, you can use uh, this kind of thing. So you might use a 3D printing food to print your, your lunch or dinner in space. So that's how they do it. And the way that we teach, are we teaching the way that, you know, using pen and paper, whiteboard, blackboard, that's 1.0. Are we teaching using OHP, what, you know, overhead projector, 2.0. Are we teaching using online? That's what we are doing now. Uh, webinars, 3.0. But the way that if you teach in 4.0, you might use your robots for your teachers. You might use augmented reality to really clearly understand you know, things, you know, from remote, and that's 4.0. And the way that we transact in your commerce, buy things, is it physically using money? Or is it using machines that to transact, your calculator to give you the, the, remand, the remainder? Or you might to use a credit card online? Or you might use augmented reality, your ePay, your e-wallet, you know, Apple Pay, uh, this is truly intelligence. So you might have blockchain even for your payment. So that is maybe 4.0. So again, I'd like to pose you this question. Just put in the chat. Where are we now? So, so that's one of the things that we, we, we always ask our, our, our uh, uh, industry. And they say that we are not even at 3.0 we are still at 2.7 yeah so we are 2.7 because we are not 100 percent everything online there are things that we do is still manual you know you want to pay things you want to do some claim for example you can claim and you say is that use a pdf but a pdf need to be print out to do manual for signature and then scan it back and then print it scan it back digitize it and send it back so it's not like a total 100 percent online so online means uh, you must make an approval process without even using a pen and paper. That is totally 3.0. Otherwise, you are still in the middle between 2.0 or 3.0. What more that you have not used technologies like blockchain for your technology, like you know, for claims and all that. So machines like this can, can play a big role in terms of big impact to the jobs. Of course, I'm not saying that you know, uh, you're safe with technology, but there are things that your technology, the technology can replace. It's very destructive. The customer service can be replaced by the robots. Citizenship can be replaced by people like Sophia. Machines, astronauts that fly in the ISS can be replaced by Simon. You know, it's a robot AI ball that can float and can take information and can give information easily on, on, on a machine. You know, animals too can be replaced by robots. You know, so these are the, the, the things that you can see, the one that do dirty things, dangerous things, demeaning things can be replaced by robots, by machines. Yeah. So it's actually to help us, you know, we don't go to war, you know, machines that go to war. You go to places which are very dangerous or radioactive, machines will be doing that for you. So it helps us. So there's a many kind of jobs that can be replaced by machines, but there are certain jobs cannot be replaced by machines. You know, uh, jobs which have emotions and all that, empathy, uh, it's very difficult for machines to replace us. Until a certain time, 
when things are like Terminator movie, they, they can replace us. But anyway, when we say that this is very important and can transform things, why we are so difficult for us to make changes? It's because one of the things people have difficulty to really identify where to start, you know, how to start, what's the first steps needed, what are the business problems that is very critical in our organizations to make the changes. That's what makes it difficult. And then once they have that, they don't know whether what's the easiest way for us to, to buy these things or to sell these things. What's the new business model is going to take place? You know, you, they have to think the way new processes, you know, you must be very agile. You cannot have so many processes in place again. You have to reduce a lot of red tapes. A change management needs to happen. And you need to break down all the silos within organizations. Too many decision makers, because technology now go across not only one, but all across the organizations. The culture, the people who, who works and the management might be the, the, the different kind of generation. You might have the baby boomers in the management level who are very analog kind of thinking. Uh, experience, but still analog. <laughs> then you have the new generations, the digital native who are very online, digital. Everything is all the tools it must be in front of them. Otherwise, it's very difficult for them to work. So they have a clash of clash of cultures, for example. Uh, one is needs very fast, one takes time and all that. So you need to have these new talents that come in and replace uh, some of the old ones. So as you, and you also need to have, to unlearn all the old things and relearn new things. Yeah? And if you want to get the buy-in, you get new projects, build a new project, what we call pilot projects, get the buy-in. So these are the, some of the challenges that we're facing. Because a lot of times when you are too, too, too simply, too uh, comfortable, management are very difficult to make that big jump. So that's why I said, this is a revolution. Revolution needs to make a drastic change. You cannot like, okay, I want to jump. How do you want to jump? Slowly. You cannot jump slowly. You need to jump. Jump. Yeah. So it means that you need to make that kind of push. Go and get that big jump. So that's the only way to do that. So a lot of times we have done this many, many times. We have tried to encourage people, hey, let's move into digital transformation. You know, you can't be more comfortable. You need to wake up. But it's very difficult. For many years, uh, myself and some of the teams tried to change the way that uh, in Malaysia, for example, let's move into digital transformation. But the, the easiest way is that last year when this thing happened, COVID-19, it becomes the wake up call to all organizations. They really understand that now technology plays a bigger role. Telecommunications itself is a very big, very big role. I don't understand why telecommunications become uh, the jumot kan, you know, being apa the jumot kan dalam bahasa bahasa Inggeris, I'm not uh, being taken uh, away as one of the core core courses. So it should be we should focus back on telecommunications because it's very key. When things like this, you cannot be physically, you know, uh, make contact. The only way is for remote communications to happen. Internet is one of the key elements. We don't want to have access to internet by climbing trees anymore. So you want to have access anywhere. And the coverage is, you know, not only coverage, but the speed plays a big role. The speed means that new applications can, can be introduced. The lower speed, only a few applications, but the higher speed, it gives you better applications. Video call like this will not be possible five years ago. You cannot have that kind of you know, with lower speed, you can have these webinars with 200 people online. It's impossible for you to do that. But now it's possible. Yeah, of course, no one, not all of you have that video with, with camera and all that. But at least it's a starting point. And Malaysia is now launching My Digital. Yeah, so that's one of the key elements to transform all our work operations into digital. So digital signature is also going to be introduced. So that is the, the revolution that we want not evolution, right? So this is very destructive. And then, okay, if you want to do that, if you are in whichever industry or sector that you're working with, you can use IR 4.0 to benefit in all aspects of the business. So courses like this, I just now in early the morning, we talk about of how technology like IR 4.0 can play a role, a drastic role in the logistic industry, logistic sector. sector. So, for example, 
uh, IR 4.0 can transform the seven M of the business. We take a look at the first M. When we talk about first M, about the manpower, the huge amount of manpower being used, are you utilizing it 100% or you overstaff, for example? Or is it, are they very effective, very productive? Can technology can help them? So you can do some remote monitoring. You don't have to send people out. So from remote monitoring, you can reduce or even increase your productivity. So technology like this can help you. you know? So you can do training for manpower using virtual reality, augmented reality, you can do that. And then materials, the way that you send things from the air, the sea, and the land, you can, you can check where are the logistics, the assets, the things that you want to monitor. Are they in a very good condition? Are they in a very safe condition? And where they are? So technologies like IoT can put sensors in all places, whether uh, at the, the transport or, the, or, or the, the, the container, the boxes, when it cross the gateways, the, the locations, it's all being tracked. So technology will help you in terms of not overstock the warehouse or understock the warehouse. So just in time sort of thing. So that's the second M. The third M is that you can look at your machines, the assets that you are being used, machines which is very expensive, either whether they are fully utilized or underutilized. Can you use the spare underutilized time and you can rent it out to make money and save costs further? Or you can even check whether how often it creates errors. If, there is, if there's a lot of errors, it shows that it requires maintenance. So you need sensors to monitor all your machines. Yeah? That will help you in terms of the uptime of your machine. So every time, sometimes a one hour downtime of your logistics can cost you millions of ringgit. So technology can play a big role. The fourth M is about the method. So before the days, with, with the, with, before the technology, you might use people in between to make sign off. So a certain process, after you arrive, you need to sign off by certain people. So a few people need to sign off, check it out whether the items are right and so on and so forth. But technologies, blockchain, you know, can, can make sure that there is no tempered uh, of information. Uh, what's been sent is what you receive, is that's the data. So it cannot be tempered. So they don't have to have a middleman in between. A contract can be created. The moment it triggers the contract, a, block, a blockchain contract, it can trigger the, 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 the transaction process automatically. So without human in the middle. So it reduces all the red tapes faster, very efficient. So we don't want to, you know, things that you can handle within one day, uh, you need to take seven days because you need to find the people to make that sign off. So that reduces these processes. And then the fifth one, the market. So it seems that the market now, uh, technologies like this can go across other global market. What we are doing now in Malaysia can be applied and you can reach out to market easily. With digital, it's easier for you to, 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 to reach out the market outside. And then the sixth, the money. So for some organization, they feel that if you are a product house, you feel that, hey, my product is stagnant. I cannot grow anymore. I don't know what to do. But with new technologies, you can create new products that can you know, disrupt new things, new revenue streams for you. Uh, think as you can create the products which is before this uh, an air condition is not connected but when air condition is be connected it's a new product you can do maintenance you know uh, when when other assets the bus is not connected when you bus is being connected it's a new product itself, right so you can create new business models out of that and then finally with all the information that you get you will have the management the data is now being come from various sources of data and it's not only one single source, many sources of data. So you don't make decisions based on one view, but you base decision on multiple view. And even when this data is being displayed on a dashboard, if you can do machine learning, you can do some predictive, you can even predict when it's going to go down, when it goes up and so on and so forth. So it's a better decision making process and in real time. Otherwise, every week we have to generate and churn out reports physically on paper but now it's everything online. So that's how technology can help. Regardless whether you are in logistics sector, whether you are in agriculture, whether you are in education, this 7M applies throughout. Yeah? So you just find which are the business issues, use technology, 
to help you in that matter. And then technology like this, I think what uh, Mr. Tan have also described is quite good, how the microelectronics have grown first and how it generates new products and services. You know, this IoT is also the same thing. At one time, it's just like a ripple, but now it's become a big tsunami because everything can be connected. Why? Hardware is becoming cheaper, smaller, and more powerful. Yeah? Connectivity is everywhere. You can find it you know, from local to wide area. Software becoming more simpler, more powerful uh, to, to create even applications. There are so many tools to be there. Most law, every 18 months, you can see the number of transistors double. So the, 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 the same footprint can have double more transistors. Metcalf's network law, I mean, everything is connected. More data is going to be generated. So this is what the inflection point that we are seeing now. Maybe Kevin Ashton never predicted this in 1999 because the technology are still very expensive, hardware expensive, coverage is not there, internet is limited, so on and so forth. But now, it's just no longer about monitoring lipstick. It can be more than that. So you can see that uh, anything that you can imagine of, not only the lipsticks that <laughs> Kevin Ashton mentioned, any access which you feel is very important to you can be connected to the internet. You can put the right sensors, regardless of what sensors it is. The goods that you want to monitor, whether it's the condition of the good, temperature, humidity. If the health is your assets, you monitor them, the blood pressure, the heart rate, and so on and so forth. If the house is your safety, you need to monitor using your camera as the eyes. If your bus, look at, uh, usage of the bus is uh, important, you need to have an OBD inside the bus that can monitor the condition of the, the whole bus. And the parking lot is yours. Your assets, the parking operator needs to know utilization of the assets or the parking lot. So anything that you feel that you want to monitor as a product or the product itself is there, but you want to monitor the, the, the environment of that, that, that within the asset. Yeah. So when you implement IoT, there are different pieces of IT maturity. You can be you know, starting off from monitoring, then you can have actuators to do control, then you can put more sensors, you can do optimization, and finally you become autonomous. So any industry, I can tell you any industry you work with, you go throughout all of these four phases. In vehicle monitoring, in vehicle industry, you can do a simple process of monitoring, put a simple GPS, it monitors the location of your vehicle. You put sensors that can, uh, actuators that can control, Whenever that you want to do, like someone steal your car, you can immobilize the engine. You can do uh, security uh, immobilizer. That's another new business. You know? Previously, for, from vehicle monitoring to vehicle security, there's a new business. You upgrade your business. And then if you have sensors that can uh, tell the condition of your, your engine with the OBD, the onboard diagnostic port, you can attach it. You can send the data, talk about your engine level, the fuel level, your, the tire, battery, and all that, you can sense and you can have this diagnostic and send to the workshop. So to do a predictive maintenance, alert you about new maintenance, you know, when that you can send for repair and all that. So because a lot of data is being generated. And then if your car is being equipped with LIDAR, many more other sensors that can talk to another car, talk, recognize uh, uh, animal to humans and all that, become autonomous car. So every time, this new four phases of maturity level, it gives you different business opportunities. And as I said, it become very disruptive. So what, you know, when we take a look at taxi, taxi at one time is everyone can become a taxi driver, right? But once uh, taxi driver is being replaced by autonomous taxi, no one can become a taxi driver anymore. So you lose jobs. So it, it becomes disruptive. In US, this is about 10%, 10% of the jobs are being affected by driver, uh, uh, autonomous vehicles, from the bus, the lorries, the logistics, you name it, <laughs> taxi driver, whoever, is being affected by driverless taxi. So again, this disruptive will not stop because what's after driverless taxi is when the taxi fly. So when the taxi fly, it also give a very big disruptive in terms of logistic business the way that you carry people, the way that you carry goods, you know, the, the way that you do emergencies. 
is also by, being, being taken care by the flying taxi. It's not the flying car, the flying taxi. This car is actually a drone. A drone is like a helicopter who can, in a vertical takeoff, it's not like you're having a runaway to take off. So it's a vertical takeoff, like a helicopter. But then it poses a big challenges. Is it, a, is it a ta this taxi? Is it a car? Is it a helicopter? Is it like what? So, so it have a regulatory issues. So that's why we need to have this trial. It's important for new technologies to happen and being embraced in, 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 in our country. One of the reasons we need to understand how technology matured, how far is this being matured. Secondly, we want to see whether how is being adopted and being used by the people. Third, we want to see whether how the business model is going to be, you know, how we want to charge the users. Is it based on subscription based or outcome based? And the fourth one, we want to see the policy and reg 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 regulatory. As I mentioned, autonomous car is very difficult now. Maybe it's in a very confined area. We are not going to trial this on public roads. And then flying taxis is not here yet, but they are trying to send a, a drone that can send parcels, logistics purpose. But drones cannot fly everywhere. So they have some regulatory. Uh, you must have a license. In Putrajaya, for example, they mentioned that in area of Putrajaya, you cannot fly drones. It's been forbidden. So you cannot do anything on at Putrajaya. So, because it's very secure area, you cannot go to uh, government offices, maybe for spying and all that. And even at the house, it's also very difficult. It's very, you know, at the back of the house. So people cannot have um, drones fly everywhere. So a specific routes need to be, to be defined. And then data also is very important. So once you want to implement IoT, you got to understand who owns the data. Is it you, personal? Is it private organization? Is it public by the government? Or is it someone who wants to sell the data? It's become commercial. So define earlier so it's easier for you to share, sell, or make it free. Eh? So you can you have to define that. So data can come uh, from, uh, from a basic raw data, because data is the new currency they call it, or black oil, or oil, but it's a very black oil, it's very numbers only. But it's more important for you to bring the data to more value. So it goes up to a value pyramid. The higher you go up, people will who buy the data or buy the information or buy the, the things that they want to answer. So if you answer the questions of who, what, where, and when, it become information. And when you answer the questions of how, it become knowledge. When you can answer the question of why, it become understanding. The higher it goes up, so you become very wise and all that. So wise, you must have some empathy, emotion inside that. Which machines doesn't have that now. So you can answer the questions of why at the moment. So people pay you at the high level. So whenever you make an IoT solutions or IR 4.0 solutions, ask the below questions first. So then you can find the right sensors. Whether the sensors is RFID for tagging, a location for GPS, camera for recognition and all that. So you can use different sensors. So sensors can come from anywhere, different sources. But if you have a single platform that can aggregate the sensors together and the data together, you can create more applications. This is what I call the blending of the data. Blending of the data, you can blend into make into one application, a good application. You can combine from food, waste, waste or health, transport, office or health. So different applications can, a different can, can be created. Yeah. So then you recover the IoT platform. So this is where our role is. Yeah. So this is where I, I'll show you a little bit our journey. Favorite, you, you pronounce it as a favorite or favorite IoT. So we started off building an application IoT called Rakib. It is meant for senior citizen. Our idea is to help the people who are living at home live alone, but not left alone. We have heard about a lot of people, uh, a lot of seniors are living alone with no children, or the children are busy working. So if there is any emergency, what's going to happen to them? So if they fall down, if they need help and all that, if they go out. Sometimes they have dementia, they forget to go back. So where are they, the location? So we have a, what we call a wearable device. They wear it, they have a GPS, we locate them where they are. So we have a geofencing. When they go out, you get detected. When they come back to the home, you also notice that they'll come back to home. And you can measure their blood pressure, the heart rate, and their activities, whether they're walking or not. So if they need emergency, they just press a button. So this is what we call rocket for elderly. Yeah? 
So we can extend this this these applications to uh, monitoring people going for Hajj also. So that's one application that we have built. Secondly, we feel that hey, locations can also be being, being used by our IoT device, which is a smartphone. Smartphone have a GPS, so that is the simplest location tracker that you can be uh, you can use. Yeah. So so we use a smartphone instead of phone instead of a watch. So we we build application called Discover. So a discover can help you in terms of uh, finding the locations. If you're in a group, yeah, if you're in a group, you can know the locations of your members inside the group, where they are. You can also have your privacy too. Lah. You can disable the location if you want to. So within your group, you can also have a geofencing. Whenever the person comes to the office, come to, to the place of your interest, they will get notified. You have already arrived in that place. So the same thing like Rocket. And you can monitor the historical where they have been and uh, you know your friends where they, where they are uh, when you are traveling in, in a group for example so you might have a list of things to do for family members who says that uh, children your son have to buy this your daughter have to buy this so you have a to-do list for you to check out you know you can do this and then you have a planner for whenever you make a travel within your group members either family or friends so you can download this on uh, discover this uh, uh, there's a free version but also there's a premium version, which has a lot more features that you can have there. So you have an SOS, you have a chat session, you know, inside there, you can have alerts whenever you want to. So uh, this is only not only for friends and families, you can be for tourists, for employees, employer, NGOs, for projects, you know, for people for security purpose. You can use that. You can download it anytime if you want to. Okay. And then there's the third application that I'd like to share with you. Is this is the core business that we have been building for NIOT. Rakib is also applications being built on top of favorite IoT platform. So any IoT devices can be connected to that. So favorite is actually what we call a platform as a service. As you know, traditionally, if you have everything that you manage yourself from the applications up to all the networking, the hardware, the CPU, the OS, you manage on premise. That is the traditional way. But sometimes you don't have the skill, then you outsource this to other people. And uh, you say that networking side, which up to virtualization, vendor will manage it, the rest you manage it. Then it becomes infrastructure as a service. Yeah? You can expand your, 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 your OS and whatever you have control. But if you only concentrate on your application, if you only concentrate on data, you own your data, that's it. The rest allow the vendor to do it, then it becomes platform as a service. That's what we are doing now. So Fabric takes the role of all the blue items. You just manage your own data. You manage your own application. Yeah. So the rest, let us take the, the, the all the complexities. Otherwise, uh, you can go to the software as a service, which uh, now is on Gmail, Google Mail, Webinar, Zoom, it's all software as a service. So you don't own anything, but they provide you as a service. So IoT platform can play many, many, uh, many roles. One is that uh, it's pub. Uh, comes from many places. It's public, big companies like Amazon, Google, Microsoft, they are the big players, which come in later. And then we have the open source player, uh, things big, you know, uh, car and all that. Uh, these are the open source community. And then you have end-to-end -end connectivity, the one who build the hardware, they, they have their own platform, but they didn't make the platform open. Eh? So they can you cannot use their platform to connect to your sensors. But then we have another group category called developer friendly, like ourselves, favorites, carriers are developer friendly. So you can connect any of your sensors, you can connect, you can create your own applications, and you can manage your own content. So this is what we call developer friendly. So we have seen a lot of projects in the universities. You have difficult time to, to, to focus on your project because sometimes the lab also doesn't have a very complete IOTs. The four components I mentioned to you, you might have three, you might not have four. So even you have the four, you ask the people to find their own platform to connect. Then you have to ask the students to find and search, do their own research about 400 to 800 uh, IoT platforms around the world. So they got confused, so complex. They waste time in build, trying to search which platform. And then uh, you cannot complete on time because either you focus on electronics part, the hardware, or you focus on the application side. And you, you cannot complete end-to-end -end size. In the big companies also, we, we don't focus all the four main components. We can specialize only a few. So you have times, difficult time to, to troubleshoot your, your whole system. So we don't want you to waste time. 
And then uh, sometimes you want to create your dashboard, you have to build your own. So it takes time to do that. So what we, what we are helping the students, the lecturers, the, the, the industry players is that we have this platform as a service. We allow you to connect whatever sensors you have down there using whatever REST, Go app or MQTT protocol to connect the platform, manage the devices easily, have an API that can you extract the data out if you want to and create your own dashboard, or you can use the dashboard which is already within Fabric. So Fabric has its own way of doing things. You subscribe to the platform, uh, you can see the data streams that go in and out of the platform. You can have your own dashboard to view your data. You can have a, a extensive num, uh, uh, documentation for you to try out. There are a lot of tutorials that you is built being, being, being uh, compiled for you, either YouTube or even some uh, documentations. And then once you want to start, you can find a whatever development board out there. Uh, normally, uh, we have our partner like you know like MyDuino, so we use Hibiscus, uh, one of the way that to to connect the sensors. And then you can have sensors which you want to connect. You can find this anywhere within the, the, the marketplace, uh, depending on which applications. And then you can start your journey. An example, Hibiscus as a sensor, uh, IoT kit. They have many sensors there. They have the uh, altitude, barometer, humidity, temperature, accelerometer, gyroscope. It's already built in. You don't have to build your own. Uh, but if you want to build, you can put your extra sensors. You can connect either Bluetooth or Wi-Fi to another gateway. And from there, you can connect to the, the uh, favorite platform. And then you can extract the data for dashboard or you can create your own application. So this is how people do very simple steps. And then from there, you can create your own applications, lah, whether it's meant for certain uh, sector, sector uh, problem statement that you want to have, you know, man, 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 man down detection, no movement, personal ID, location, two voice communications. This is meant for uh, delivery boy, uh, taxi, or uh, senior people, security. So it regulars. So it's so many applications that cannot be built. So this is what uh, a cabinet have been, you know, defined earlier in the early stage. Now being expanded to many things. So for example, uh, we have done this. Uh, there's one campus that we help them because they have many buildings. There are many network hubs inside each building. So whenever there's a system down, internet connectivity is down, people blame the IT. In fact, it's not the IT, the network is down, it's sometimes just the power. So the power should be taken care of by the facility management. The network should be taken care of by the IT people. So there are two people who make that service. So what we have done, is we put a, a power control monitoring. So whenever it detects the power is down, it sends a telegram message to the facility management or send to the, the IT people. So if the network is down, then the facility management will come in. But when suddenly the, the, the power is up, it's being restored, it will send another message. So it's a very simple way of notifying the management people. So this is one way to do uh, maintenance. So there are many applications that can be built, you know, uh, for water monitoring, weather monitoring, you can have uh, parking, you can have noise and air pollution, you can have asset monitoring, warehouse, smart factory. So there are so many applications that you can build. So now we have about more than 110 countries around the world is doing that, even Indonesia too. We have several of our uh, uh, subscribers from Indonesia, but more than 4,400 developers are using this platform. And they, I, I don't know because they had subscribed their own uh, platform and they build their own applications. So we have YouTube tutorials that you can scan this. I will give you the link, even the, the, the information on, to download the, the, the slides. Eh? So we have uh, tutorials. Uh, we have the IoT blocks. Uh, all the thoughts that I have, I put inside the blocks about the challenges that we face. And then uh, I just want to, want to share it because this is what we are seeing. It's being disruptive and it can encompass, go across many industries. Yeah. So what we need to do now is that we need to cross the chasm. You need to become the innovators, the one that create new things, create new things, become the early doctors who can uh, test it out, you know, make sure that we have attraction because you want to cross the chasm, chasm because the moment you don't have the attraction, the project or the product or the service just die down. It's not enough for it to sustain. 
the moment it crosses the chasm, become early majorities can use it, then it can survive by itself. So a lot of companies fail because it goes down the chasm. So a lot of products fail because it doesn't meet the demands of the users. And then you have the late majority, but we don't want to become the laggards. The one is too late into the market in terms of embracing new technology. So how do we start? We start by building applications, defined in very small applications that can have a big impact, get the buy-in. Later, you can integrate this with the existing system, with your old, uh, the, old, uh, the old system, with your new system. And then you can innovate this with your create new applications, new workflow, new business model, and better analytics, more data. So before I end, I would like to have this contest. So guys, prepare this a little bit. This contest, I'll give a three prizes, a free premium package, which one year subscription worth 134 ringgit for you for free. So the, how we want to do it is this. Quickly log in or scan this QR code, register using your uh, email address as a free user. Okay. Number, the first one, the number 10 and number 20 who registered this will get a free premium discover one year subscription for free. And we will notify the winners via the email or if we have time, I will notify this before the end of the presentation. Okay, guys. So I just give you take a look at this for a couple of minutes, scan it. Uh, I think at the moment you can scan it, you can register this easily. Yeah? So uh, I, I understand that you have about 261 people on board, but only the three lucky ones will receive this premium Discover service. So hold on, uh, I will check it out. I think we have a few more minutes for us to make the uh, meet. And we have a question and answers. Okay. So uh, just jot down the the, the me platform.fabra.com. Okay. And I have one more slide I'd like to share with you before we end this. So the winner will uh, okay. The, the winner will start at twelve fifty something just now. The moment that I went, I, I'll introduce you to that. I think. Okay. So while you are doing that, I also like to inform you guys. Okay. I haven't seen anyone register yet, eh? so but it's coming. So I mean, so it's very simple. Use your belly email address. I also would like to give you another price, lah. Yeah. So this price is a special fifty percent vouchers for the beginner plan discount. So it is limited to ten vouchers, limited time. So this one you subscribe, but only get fifty percent discount. So normally it's 100 ringgit per year. Now it's only 50 ringgit per year. So use the voucher code FKEEUTHM when you register. So it's very limited time. It's barely until 15 of June. So I can see that a lot of people have registered now. Uh, so I'll we still monitor that, you know, because up to number 20 can get the, the price. Yeah. So I will monitor that. And also if if you want to upgrade your free plan into beginner plan, use this voucher. All right. So thank you very much. I'll pass back to the moderator, Dr. Rose, for any question and answers. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Mazlan, for sharing with us your overwhelming knowledge and experience. So now I would like to open for Q&A session. Participants can ask questions in the chat box for Dr. Mazlan. Uh, we have three questions right now. Okay. Uh, for the first one, as I'm like from Dr. Majlan, I, I want to ask two questions. This is from Uzai Somro. The first one, what is your opinion on the IoT and IR 4.0? Are people taking care of the environment and since before, all were done using papers and now they realize their mistake not taking care of the environment? Uh, what is your opinion on the IoT of people taking care of the environment? Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, yes, I think that's the I, that's the the reason why uh, we are we are transforming ourselves into digital era. Uh, it will uh, help us in terms of you know uh, becoming more green. 
And technology like this will help us a lot, especially for example, I give an example uh, to make it more green and be taking care of the environment. Uh, sm uh, smart parking is the easiest example because smart parking, the moment you can find your parking, it can reduce the congestion. Remember, people are areas which are very congested is because the car are go round and round to find a car park. It's not very easy to come out. So the moment it goes around to find a car park, it, it produces a lot of carbon. And uh, if you have technology that can help you to identify where's the location of the free parking, you can find the parking easily. You can stop the engine. You can reduce carbon. The whole environment is becoming green. Uh, now, I think that's one way of you know, making, making an environment green. Uh, so that's one, one way. Okay. Okay. Uh, the second question, how the changes in IoT and IR 4.0 has an impact in healthcare facilities or devices, especially in Malaysia. And if we can just see yesterday, the facility of ICU is already full. How they are going to take on people? Yeah, one of the things that we are seeing is that uh, uh, sometimes people go to the hospital because they are worried that they require more medical attention. Whereas there's actually there, there are other people who are in need a lot more. Because of that, when people are being hospitalized, they take the space more than, you know, where, uh, compared to the, the actual people that requires that space. So when we use technology like this, you can do some remote teleconsultation. You can monitor from remote. You can do quarantine from home and monitor this regularly until the time that you require to go to the hospital. Otherwise, you can still get information and uh, uh, exchange with your doctor online and they can monitor this from you. Because otherwise, people feel that they need to see the doctor, you know, physically. But in fact, they, they shouldn't. I mean, they, we can reduce that uh, people going to the hospital. And this is one way of technology can, uh, can help uh, play a role. So another thing is that, as you know, that technology like this can do contact tracing easily. So it can help us to identify people who have uh, cases and can quarantine them faster than before. So it reduce that, that people sending to the hospital. Yeah, thank you. Okay. And then the third question from Mohamed Nikli. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, sorry, good afternoon, dear sir. What are challenges for IoT and IR currently facing, especially as application? Uh, maybe the question is too general. Uh, I have mentioned to you just now about the challenges that IR 4.0 is facing, the nine challenges. So you can take a look at back at the nine challenges. This is more about uh, having the challenges to be implemented. Yeah? And, uh, and if you talk about application itself, one of the challenges that we face in IoT is that all IoT, nearly all IoT applications that we, we being asked to do needs a lot of customization work. So it's not like off the shelf. You can buy a product, you can buy application, you can launch it easily. Normally, it's going to do some a lot of customization. So sometimes a customization requires, you know, sensors can be fixed, connectivity can be fixed, platform can be fixed, application can be many forms. You can, you can create new applications for them. You can create new analytics for them. You can create new dashboard for them. So this is what required in application customization work. So maybe thirty percent of the work requires you to do a lot of customization. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so far, uh, these are only the questions. Uh, anyone uh, want to ask Dr. Manslan directly here? I've also Dr. given the, the link to the slides. Uh, you can download from that lah. Yeah. yeah. Hold on. Eh? Uh, let me check whether there is a winner. Okay, there is a winner. Uh, for the Discover Premium, okay. Uh, number one is Nur Atirah Wani binti Rahimi. Okay. Number one, Nur Atirah Wani binti Rahimi. We will contact you through email. Uh, number two is Nur Farina Zainal. Nur Farina Zainal. And the third one is Gusinia Nageswara Rao. Gusinia Nageswara Rao. So congratulations to them. We'll send you the, the voucher directly to you guys. Lah. Yeah? If the rest is just use the voucher for the, all right? Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, 
thank you Dr. Mazlan. Since uh, there are, okay, one more question. Dr. Mazlan, to be an IoT engineer, what is the complementary skills needed, especially from the engineering background with less knowledge computer science? Thank you. Okay. From Dr. Razali Tumari. Okay. With less computer science, for engineering side, I think it's much easier. Yeah, because kalau on the uh, a real true IoT engineer can go across the electronic up to the programming part lah kan, if that's possible. But if you are more in the electrical part, then it's about designing the, the, the IoT device. A lot of applications now require you to customize the application device to whichever application, uh, application scenario lah. So sometimes you must find the right sensors, the right microprocessor, the right connectivity, and then find the right way to, uh, to program the embedded device. Embedded. So programming, you cannot run away. Uh, at least you need to do some programming to, uh, to, uh, to uh, the device, and then to connect these sensors to the, the platform itself. Yeah? So that's the skill in the electronics part. Lah. I think uh, uh, if you can make it more uh, cheaper, uh, simpler, a modular and smaller is much better. So that, that's the challenge that you need to, to, to have and uh, find the right skills to do that. Lah. So microelectronics is one of the things that you need to learn. Lah, kan? uh, sensors is the one that you need to learn from how to turn from analog to digital and make it more accurate, lah, you know, the sensitivity of the data. Okay, But if you want to go for uh, to the upper layers, then you have to learn uh, different programming language, for example, like C, C++, uh, Python, and so on. Uh, that's on the higher layers. OK, uh, another question from IoT. Assalamualaikum, Dr. Manzlan. I am interested in this topic. More on technical consideration. In terms of cost and long-term reliability, favorite versus lower one, can Dr. Manzlan discuss or elaborate the bit? Okay, uh, favorite and lower one is two different things. Uh, favorite itself is not, a uh, favorite is a middleware, a platform. So if you uh, listen just now, uh, we have four components, right? We have four components, the sensors, connectivity, um, platform, and also applications. We are on the third one, is the platform. LoRa one is on the connectivity. It's a connectivity protocol. So you need to, to have your own LoRa one node, LoRa one gateway, and uh, to to apa tu? Uh, LoRa one is the the one that you uh, uh, apa tu? Connect to your sensors, and then LoRa one gateway for you to send the data to the internet, and then from there, this is where favorite plays a role lah, uh, so to collect the data. Uh, just now, I think I, I have uh, shared to you. Uh, to, uh, let me share again slightly. So if you take a look at macam ini, Laura one too can be from uh, before the gateway and after the gateway. So favorite is actually on the platform side. So, so it's different from Laura one. Okay, thank you.